Jamie and I are so glad you've joined us year in and year out to talk about writing and publishing. If you've gotten value from the podcast and you'd like to return the favor, you can show your support by becoming a subscriber. We'll give you a shout out on a future episode. Go to wishidknownforwriters.com slash support to learn more. Now let's get on with the episode. Welcome to the Wish I'd Known Men podcast, where we focus on how authors found success, looking at strategies that have taken them to the top of the bestseller charts, as well as what they've learned from their mistakes. Because being an indie author is more than knowing the latest marketing trend. It's about being innovative and creative and learning from your mistakes. Welcome to the Wish I'd Known Men podcast. I'm Sarah Rosette. And I'm Jamie Albright. And this week on the show, we have... Maria Lewis. Yes, we do. That's my girl. We've yeah. known each other since the week we started publishing. We both published the same week. We talk about that in the episode, yeah. but she's a good friend. She's taught me a lot and we've been through a lot. So yeah, yeah. she's your new release buddy. Like she your, is. your launch buddy for yeah. like your yeah. initial book. So that's yeah. Really cool. yeah, it was really cool. Yeah. So it was a great episode. It was yeah, a great she episode. She has some great ideas and great tips and talked mm-hmm. about transitioning like from rapid release to slower releases Mm -hmm. and changing genres Mm -hmm. using tropes so much good stuff in this yeah and one of the things yeah mindset stuff yeah one of the things that I really loved about what she said was you know we talk a lot about genre expectations on this show Mm -hmm. but but she had a very healthy fan base before she switched genres and she she did it in such a cool way and you'll hear about that but also she took the re- her readers expectations of maria lewis stories into account when she was thinking mm-hmm. about the genre expectations of the genre she was moving into and i think that's why she's been pretty successful about uh bringing a lot of her readers with her when yeah. she switched so it was really smart really smart yeah. Yeah, lots of great ideas. If you're thinking mm-hmm. that or think that you may want to change in the future, then yeah, definitely, mm-hmm. definitely give it a listen. So, yeah. Um, so we have some supporters. Should we go? Yes, we do. Let's do it. Okay. So um, we have Elise Kennedy and she picked the the red heart for her mm-hmm. emoji. And then I'll let you do the others. Okay, we have Jennifer Leo, and she had a heart, and Sierra Cross, and we are so grateful that you guys are supporting, and so tell me what's been going on this week. Well, my biggest news is that I finished my draft, so I ah, hope so. Yay. <laughs> yeah, That's so great. Yeah, it needs a lot of work, you know, yeah. as I always do, but yeah. that's like a huge relief, so, yeah. so I'm working on that, and then... um I don't know if you can see behind me, but I have like papers like all over Mm -hmm. little sticky notes doing Mm -hmm. taxes. Yes. Thinking about, remember what, like weeks ago I said, Mm -hmm. oh, think about taxes, but I was only thinking about them. I wasn't doing Uh. about them. (laughs) (laughs) So now I'm actually getting out all the paperwork and it's, Uh. it's okay. But on that note, I learned something that I did not know and it blew my mind. What? Because with all this stuff, you have to uh, send lots of paperwork back and forth. Uh-huh. Did you know on the iPhone, your notes app has a scanner on it? No. I did not know this. And you can go in there. I think you choose, I forget which button you choose, but you, you click a, you know, one of the things and it just brings up this like yellow square and you put it over whatever you want to scan and it scans it and saves it as a PDF. Uh-uh. Or, is, or is it in JPEG? I know. That's what I thought. And uh, so with all this tax stuff, that's mm-hmm. what I'm going to be doing. And then like when you get done, it says, are you, you know, do you scan the next document? And I right. was like, oh my goodness, because oh. you, have, you have to sign something. And like, Yes. A, like such yes. A- and we've had, we've had an issue with that recently because one, our comp- our printer mm-hmm. is down and two, yeah, my husband actually had to drive into downtown to, to sign some things That's because big. we didn't have a scanner and our, our, comp- our printer was down and. I know. Yeah. So oh. I just found that out this week. Um, I'm sure if you Google it, there'll be like a, like yeah, a, yeah, yeah. or something, but I was like, wow, that'll That's make amazing. my life a little bit easier. Yeah. So, oh. Anyway. So that was my big. Yeah. <laughs> it was so exciting. You can scan with notes app. 
That's hilarious. Thank you so much. We need to get out more. <laughs> uh, so what are you doing this week? What's going on? Um, not much. Um, I have been um, um, making money, which is good. Nice. Um, and my books kind of have been making me a good amount a day. And I am... Uh, running an ad and only one I was running two and I stopped the other one because the cost per click got too high but um yeah so I'm I'm really pleased I think I've hired someone to do my TikToks for me I mean like to make TikToks I still go on there and do some silly stuff but that are book specific I've hired somebody to do that and while nothing has gone viral I do believe that they are helping with my sales. I mean, it's just, you can kind of see a bump whenever I get one that's got a lot of engagement or that has a lot of uh, uh, saves. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah. And so that, that's something I've been doing still just kind of working on my mental health and my heart. I'm at my mom's right now. Uh, Chris, um, is traveling for work. Uh, Mm -hmm. and so he had to come to Dallas. So I came in, I I rode with him and, Mm -hmm. um, I'm at my mom's. And so, yeah, just being here is nice and kind of helps me. And so, yeah, yeah. that's good. That's that's all that's going on with me. I'm sorry, y'all. I I know y'all are like this girl. Okay. So let's get it together, but I I, think you're doing just fine. (laughs) I'm doing the best I can. I'll I'll tell you that. So, and that is, that's all you can do. I mean, don't beat yourself up about it. Thanks. (laughs) Thanks. Thanks. But we should get on to Maria because I tell you what, you're really going to love this episode. Yes. All right. So here is Maria. All right. Well, today we're really excited to talk to Maria Lewis. Hi, Maria. How are you? Hi, y'all. I'm so excited to be here. No, we're so happy you're here. And it's been like forever that we kept saying we need to get Marie on the podcast. And so we finally got you on. So <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> I'm here. No worries. <laughs> so let me read your bio and then we'll get into the questions. Historian by day and romance novelist by night, Maria abandoned the cold winters of Boston for hot and humid New Orleans with a pit stop in England along the way. When Maria isn't frantically typing with hot chocolate in hand, she can be found binging reality TV, going on adventures with her better half and two pups, and plotting her next steamy romance. Yes. Yes. And you are a huge Bachelor, Bachelorette fan, correct? Yes. I mean, I hate watch it weekly, but yes. (laughs) I'm here I like 15 it. seasons later. <laughs> no, you should. I love it. That's right. Lots of drama. Lots of drama. It, it is. It's I've I've hate watched it so much that I wrote a whole series about how much That's I right. hate watched it. Oh. So like it I mean, is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? I don't know, but here we are. Here well, we, we are. Turned it here into we are. IP is so great. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so tell us how you got into writing. So I got in, so this is a very funny story. I've always enjoyed writing. Um, but, and if you ask my mom, she'll be like, back when you were like in preschool, you would write the same story about a mouse every day. And <laughs> in like preschool, they used to like bind the books for you. So I have about like 40 copies of the same story oh. of cat and mouse thing. It's She's like, would you like them? And I'm like, no, I don't think I do. But thank you for keeping all 40 of them. Um, but I really actually got into it. I was a competitive gymnast. And um, when I was in middle school, I actually fractured my back in two places. And mm-hmm. if it had been like one vertebrae down, I would have I would have been paralyzed from the waist mm-hmm. down. So recovery wow. was like eight or nine months. Like they didn't let me in the gym. I wasn't even allowed to go to the mall because that was like too much walking. Like you mm-hmm. take a take a kid that's, you know, a athlete that's in the gym 30 to 40 hours a week and then suddenly tell them like you can't even you can't even like walk really. Yeah. Like, yeah. You wow. have to just sit down and that's it. Um, and so I started going stir crazy and I would watch, I guess my reality TV started back then. I would watch uh, Judge Judy followed by <laughs> Oprah, followed by Dr. <laughs> Phil every day in that in that order until my mom was like, you have to like find something else. Like yeah. if, if you can't be doing gymnastics the way you were 
um, to find something else that makes you happy. She's like, you like to write? And I was like, mm-hmm. I do like to write. And so my dad was a, um, he was a computer tech guy for a law firm in Boston. And so mm-hmm. we always had like um, one or two uh, like extra laptops in the house that were like missing keys. Like they were like the <laughs> spare spares. And so I just found myself writing and it was the era of Pirates of the Caribbean. So of course I wrote about a pirate kidnapping a debutante and that I started from there when I oh, never came back. That's awesome. That's awesome. I don't think I knew about the pirate connection, but love yeah. that. <laughs> love that. <laughs> Maria and I have been friends since the week we both published. We published a week apart. Jamie yep. was first and I came right out. Actually, it was only two days. I think I, oh, yeah, it was, I was Tuesday and you were Thursday or something like that. It was in that week. Or maybe you were Tuesday and I was Thursday. You had already put out a prequel, but um, but yeah, we put our first books that we met because I went online frantically going, hey, my book's coming out in just a few days. Anybody want to do a newsletter swap? And Maria jumped right in and... We've been you've friends ever since. Yes, yes. you've never gotten rid of me since. <laughs> I know. And Maria is the same age as my son. And I forget that because we are such good friends until she's doing six things to my one thing. And I'm like, oh, yeah, you're 26 years younger than me. That's what the problem is. So. <laughs> <laughs> but we are we are good friends we've had some good memories and gone through some crazy stuff together so um yes, I, I'm so glad you're here um so I'm gonna go ahead and ask the next yeah, go ahead. question since I'm talking already uh so <laughs> what's your definition of success Maria so I think this is a really good question because I think my definition of success what a word um has changed over mm-hmm. the years mm-hmm. I think when I first started um and I think part of us like I think for many of us we do want that like level of fame like we want to be that author that everybody knows about like and if you say that you don't I mean some people might not feel that way but I I think a lot of us we say we don't want that but like secretly inside that's all we want is like we want to be Nora Roberts we want to be Danielle Steele like these just pioneers of romance like we crave it um Mm -hmm. and when I first started I And I still want that. And I'm Mm -hmm. totally okay with admitting it and saying that I do. But when I first started, I placed a lot of emphasis on money Mm -hmm. and how much money was I making? And was it like, could I make more? And of course, we all want to make money, right? Like we all want this to be our, we all want this to be our full-time jobs for many of us. Um, But I placed so much emphasis in of what my, how successful I was based on how much I was making. And if I wasn't making a certain amount, then like suddenly I just wasn't successful. And so nowadays I've had a few years since, you know, (laughs) since I started and I don't feel that way as much anymore. And I find I'm really big on, um, well, mental health, but I'm really big on mindset. And I find that when I stress less, more comes to me. Mm -hmm. And so I really try to live more in the present now, whereas when I first started, it was much more like, um, what are the things I'm going to do two years from now? Oh, I'm going to make a million dollars two years from now. I'm going to make $2 million or I'm going to be, my book's going to be picked up and put on the big screen. Mm -hmm. And now I really try to think about like, wow, like, I've been sick for a week now and it's okay. Like I've been at home (laughs) coughing up a storm and I still been able to work and I've still been able to make money. And Mm -hmm. so um, I'm going to go to Italy later this year for a book signing and like, how freaking cool is that? (laughs) You know, and instead of freaking out about how I'm going to pay for it, I'm like, I have the money I can pay for it because Mm -hmm. I have put in, I've put in the work and I've seen it come back to me. And Mm -hmm. so I really have tried to kind of shift my mindset on what success means to me. So it is still like, I still want to be Nora Roberts. I will Mm -hmm. always want to be Nora Roberts. I want to see my books on the big screen, et cetera. Um, But I'm much more focused on what is my career giving to me right now, as Mm -hmm. opposed to arbitrary numbers that at the end of the day mean nothing. So, yeah. 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 Yeah, Maria and and Maria was making a lot of money. I mean, she, she really did what she wanted to do. I mean, by her standards, she was super successful and, and she's still successful, but it's just, it's hard 
I know this, when you're doing, you know, finding that, that statement at the end of the month comes and you're, you're judging everything by that. And then yeah. when that changes, having, having a real hard time finding your worth. And that's, I think what you're saying is so healthy and so great. I wish I was that smart when I was your age. So, yeah. Well, it's, it's taken a definitely two years of, uh, of, of not being in a very good place yeah. <laughs> yeah. To, yeah. to kind of refine that. So it's, it's interesting. I've, I always like to joke it is a joke, but it's not a joke at the same time mm-hmm. and say that this, this career of ours is a marathon and it is not mm-hmm. a sprint. And I mm-hmm. truly, truly believe that because if, you know, someone might be like, I just want to publish this one book and then I'm good and I'm done. Mm-hmm. And like, that's mm-hmm. all I want. But for most of us, we want this to be a long time career, something we're doing for years and years. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I think if you're doing it for years and years, you can't, you can't sustain yeah, being on this just crazy over the top hustle where the only thing that matters is what you're putting into your bank account because yeah. uh, because you're just you're not going to be able to do that long term. So well, and so much of that you can't control. You can't. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I keep hearing over and over again people talking like the word sustainability is coming up again and again and again, like in different groups of men with different writer friends, and you know that's something that we didn't really hear that much of maybe a couple of years ago. And now it's like, that's the word that everyone's mm-hmm. lo- looking for that. And I think, you know, we all want to do well. I mean, most of us here, and I think most of the listeners to the podcast want to do well and want to mm-hmm. make it a career and, you know, make money and contribute to the household income and, you know, be successful. But there's a point where you have to figure out, oh, I don't want to kill myself. I want to be able to enjoy life, you know? So it's like- And it- enjoy this career. I mean, yeah. that's, that's another thing. It, if money is all you're looking for at some point, you stop enjoying what you're doing. Yeah. Speaking from experience. Yeah. Right. No, it's so, it's so yeah. true though. Yeah. And the, isn't that sad? Like yeah. if all you've so ever sad. wanted to do is right. Like you're just like, mm-hmm. you just have that craving inside mm-hmm. you that you want to tell stories. And then suddenly you're like, wow, this, this doesn't even bring me joy anymore because mm-hmm. like I'm not making X amount of money. Yeah. yeah. It's, mm-hmm. it's sad. It's sad. Yeah. Yeah. Well, switching gears a little bit, we always want to know like um, what you wish you'd known about writing and craft. Is there anything that comes to mind for that? <laughs> <laughs> I am going to tell you with like absolute certainty that my career definitely took a turn um, when I learned about, and I don't want to say branding is in like covers, like yes, covers, but if you have a really good designer who understands the market, like they can, Mm -hmm. they can steer you in the right path, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, But I didn't understand as Theodora Taylor likes to talk about with universal fantasies, Mm -hmm. like they were in my books because like naturally we gravitate towards writing stuff like that. But Mm -hmm. I didn't understand in the beginning, like actually plucking those out and using them in a blurb or being like, oh, this book is a fake dating romance. Mm -hmm. And how easy is it to sell this book once I understand that it's a fake dating romance (laughs) as opposed Mm -hmm. to bogging it down with all this superfluous material that doesn't matter. And um I, when I first released, I rapid released mm-hmm. and um, I had spent two years writing the books before I published the first one. So I had, a, I had about six books, I think that I had previously written before hitting publish. And it wasn't until I think it was, I don't know if it was number seven, it's 10 me forever, but I can't remember the lineup of like what number of book it was, but it was fall 2017 mm-hmm. and I finally understood like whoa this is this makes a huge difference yeah. and, and um and so my career changed because of that so I mm-hmm. wish I had learned that in the beginning because some of those early books are still really difficult for me to market because I didn't really understand um the like using tropes in that way like mm-hmm. it's not enough to just tell a story like you have to really know how to market it to the consumer and mm-hmm. and some of those early books I still am like don't know how to market you because I didn't really think about that when I was writing I just like sat down and wrote so mm-hmm. um yeah that's definitely something that has made my career change for the better mm-hmm. since then so right. do you plan those things in now like when you're thinking about a book about I do. what tropes and everything how do you do that like how do you decide and 
So I sit down and um, when I sit down to write, I'm really big. This is going to sound so cheesy y'all, but I'm really big on like (laughs) moods and aesthetics and vibe. Like I like to think about like what, what feeling do I want the reader to have when they walk away from this book? And it might be one of my books is it's a dark romantic suspense and uh, it has the feeling of like a fun house, you know what I mean? Like, and, Mm -hmm. and, and so where like the cord, there are quarters that lead to nowhere and like mirrored walls that things might pop out at you at any moment. Not that there are those in the book, but that's that kind of experience I want the reader to walk away with. So mm-hmm. in the time frame that I'm thinking about all of that, I'm also thinking about, hey, like what are tropes that I want to kind of think about in this book that I want and I a lot of times I like to deconstruct them and I like to flip them on their head but I mm-hmm. need to always make sure that I and that I have at least one like one major heavy hitter and then two that I can rope in for ad copy etc mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. the two side ones maybe I won't talk about necessarily in the blurb you know what I mean mm-hmm. it might be something that doesn't come into play until um like halfway through the book so I'm not Mm -hmm. gonna it's a plot twist so I'm not Mm -hmm. going to reveal it you know in the blurb but I need to have more than just like one big one so in that Mm -hmm. time frame where I'm kind of thinking about the mood of the book and all of that I'm also thinking about what tropes I'd like to explore for those characters yeah I'm seeing a lot more um not a lot but a few like book reviewers and um even some like a bookstore that um Mm -hmm. organizes their books by um feeling and mood and like there's this one book reviewer that she does a summary each month and it's like hey um these are the books that you want to read if you want to curl up and have a cozy read these are the books that are the scary psychological you know and I thought that's so interesting because that is a lot of times how I approach what I want to read is like what kind of mood what kind of feeling do I want so I think that's very cool to think about that in the beginning yeah and yeah. your new books in particular, I mean, your your um, Put a Ring on It series ha- definitely has a mood to it, too. But yeah. your new books in particular really just convey this, this mood. And, I mean, you know what you're getting just from the colors you've used as opposed to, like, what the title is or blurb or anything like that. So Yeah, and especially because it was really important for my new series, Broken Crown, um, because the titles are quite um, abstract. Mm-hmm. They're, they're not necessarily like romance titles. And mm-hmm. I kind of did that on purpose because I wanted to try and um, like they are romance, but I wanted to try to bring in people who maybe don't pick up romance. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so I was that a good idea? I don't know, but, but, it, but it's worked, you know mm-hmm, what I mean? Mm-hmm. And so it's definitely something I'm continuing into the spinoff series as well, mm-hmm. but I really wanted to focus on again, that kind of mood. And it's actually really funny too, because um, my PA is, she used to be a preschool teacher. Mm-hmm. And when I've been doing signings lately, she like showed up on one of them with like these kind of like, like big blurb kind of cut out bubbles bubbles yeah like yeah yeah and with like blue sticks and like popsicle sticks and she was like putting them together and she's like put your tropes on these and Mm -hmm. I put them into the book and I cannot even tell you the amount of people who've come over to my table being like I love this so much it made it so easy for me to see like oh Mm -hmm. fake dating best friend's older brother love that Mm -hmm. or people who have messaged me to be like readers be like your table was like my favorite that I saw Mm -hmm. because it was so easy to like easy to digest quickly what you have as opposed to being like can you tell me what your book is about right and so I think in a in a climate where things it's like the TikTok climate right you have like two Mm -hmm. seconds to catch people's attention Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in that sort of environment like you have to really come out strong with what your Mm -hmm. what your book is about in a in the most I guess universal way possible Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it's definitely something that I think about that I didn't used to but I definitely do now yeah yeah what assumptions did you make at the beginning of your career and looking back did they turn out to be right or wrong Ooh, very Ooh, this is toughy (laughs) um I think 
I think in a work-life balance way, I think Mm. I made the assumption that working from home was going to be the best thing possible for me. Mm. And in some ways it is, you know, like I was talking earlier, like I've been sick, I can work Mm. from home. I don't have Mm -hmm. to call to a boss and be like, hi, excuse me, but I need to get off. Um, But on the other hand, I also chafe at being (laughs) like stuck, you know? And so that's, that's, that was a really hard struggle in the beginning, because I found myself being like, well, I, you know, I, I can just work all day from home and then realize that like, I actually get less done when I don't have some sort of structure. Mm -hmm. So that was an assumption that I was proved quickly wrong. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, But something I think a lot, I think a lot of indie authors who think if I don't, if I didn't have the day job, I could just, I could produce more. And then they get rid of the day job and they're like, whoa, what is happening? It's like too much freedom. It's like a toddler with no boundaries. You're like, (laughs) well, for me, it is. (laughs) Me too. (laughs) Yeah. You're just kind of like floundering around and you're like, wow, I I didn't produce a book that that happened. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. This is bad. Um, I think that's something that I think that I, I was right about was that I, I understood I've worked previously in kind of the publishing world um, Mm -hmm. from a young age. I was, uh, do you guys remember the uh, teenage for the chickens, like the chicken soup for the teenage soul? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I worked for them uh, in high school. I was, I was the, the slush pile girl, like, like having to go through all the submissions, Mm -hmm. uh, what would get put into the book and or magazine and from there, I ended up working in college for a literary assistant. Um, I was, again, the one that went read through submissions for mm-hmm. her. Mm-hmm. And so by the time that I started publishing, I was fully aware of, I guess, the, I, I think the novelty of publishing had already worn off on me. Mm-hmm. And so not to say that I was cynical or jaded, but I understood the ups and downs of the market. And I understood the importance of advertising and the Mm -hmm. importance of actually engaging with readers. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. so that, that kind of avenue didn't, I I didn't feel kind of like bludgeoned by it. Like I Mm -hmm. I didn't feel Mm -hmm. like I was like, not really sure of what to do or that, you know, oh, I just put a book out and it'll do well. Like Mm -hmm. I never had that sort of, um, I guess kind of like I think you had a realistic view of what publishing is yeah (laughs) yeah very realistic view of it yeah yeah and I think that helped a Mm -hmm. lot Mm -hmm. because I I I didn't kind of I was very eager to always learn more Mm -hmm. because I knew that there was more for me to understand and I always was very um I didn't believe in kind of the like the one magic wonder magical. Mm-hmm. of of, mm-hmm. of it yeah. all, mm-hmm. where yeah. like oh, something will just magically do well. Like I it yeah. never, I, I never was like, oh, that's gonna this that's gonna be a thing. You know, I was like, that's a rare <laughs> unicorn. Yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah. The rest yeah. of us are horses. Yes, <laughs> <You know>? exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, going back to the structure, like of your day and stuff, I think people will be curious. How do you structure your day now? Because you still work from home, right? I do. And that is a really good question. Um, <laughs> it is something I still I still struggle with. Would you it. like I, to phone in your answer later? <laughs> is this the one to skip this question I, and we'll just move on? <laughs> can I call my husband and be like, "What is your schedule today?" Yeah. Uh, so he works a really crazy schedule, and so I really do try to, because um, he can have like one day off for the whole month. So I really try to kind of align my working around. I guess when he's working, um, Mm -hmm. I cannot write when he's here. Like Mm it, it's not even like he's like bothering me. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's just like the noise factor. Like Mm -hmm. I can't Mm -hmm. um, just kind of sink into the words. So I, depending on when he is working or when he's not working, if he's here, I'm mostly working on admin Mm-hmm. You know, that side of things like the business side and then the minute he's out the door I'm like headphones on <laughs> laptop open and just like mm-hmm. writing for as long as I can so mm-hmm. it's very unstructured which is also a problem but mm-hmm. I roll yeah. with it as best as I can right, well, right. lots of, I mean it's you're, it's flexible and lots of us have yes. lives that are not like 
set in stone, like every week is the same. So like you have to have some way to handle that. So it sounds like you figured out something that works. Yeah. Mostly. <laughs> yeah. Mostly yeah. And then when deadline comes, I'm like, take the dogs, uh-huh. cook the food, don't come near me. Yeah. <laughs> and then I, and then I get over it. Yeah. 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 Well, what's the most important lesson you've learned? Um, I think this one kind of goes back to the idea of success Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's, but it's also the idea of, of having blinders on Mm -hmm. because, uh, over time I've realized that social media is not my friend. Like it Mm -hmm. is my friend in terms of, you know, getting your books out there and meeting people and, and especially in a really solitary kind of career where you can Mm -hmm. go days and days Mm -hmm. without to anybody like it's Mm -hmm. good to have friends that you can reach out to and talk to and all of that um but social media because you see everybody going at their own speed and their speed is different than your speed and you can never compare it but by human nature you can't help but Mm -hmm. compare yourself Mm -hmm. to what everybody is doing and so it for me can lead to not only anxiety but like spirals of depression because Mm -hmm. i'm like wow that person is just like flying by the seat Mm -hmm. of their pants and doing all these things. And I'm just like trucking up this hill that I feel like I've been climbing for two years now. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. so I've really taken the care and the time in the last year to support my friends, be happy for their successes, be happy for people that I don't even know, but I just see online, but Mm -hmm. keep my blinders really on 24 seven and not spend time on social media besides the bare necessities of whatever I have to do. So I no longer am doing, you know, um, like uh, parties, you know, types of things. I'm, I'm not, I don't engage as much as I used to, even in author groups, the mm-hmm. way that I did in the past. Mm-hmm. And not because I don't like those author groups, but because of the nature of scrolling. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Pre- yeah. Before you come comment or after you comment you're just scrolling and suddenly yeah. all of that is impacted and putting the pressure back on you again and so you're like wow I just did all of this work but it's it's essentially reversed and erased because five minutes of scrolling on Instagram mm-hmm. made me feel like absolute crap mm-hmm. so that I think that is the biggest lesson besides the idea of success and like what does success mean to you mm-hmm. is learning to prioritize my mental health because if I do that then I can produce more books if I produce more books I make more money and even if Mm -hmm. I don't produce more books I still can make money by a lot like allotting my time in the correct ways Mm -hmm. yeah yeah I think that's so smart and I think Mm -hmm. a lot of people are pulling back from social media in general I think it's really probably healthier for us so I think so yeah it could be such a great thing like it's Mm -hmm. so wonderful but in small doses yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, we have a lot of uh listeners who are newer. So if you were starting over, um, what would you do differently? Is there anything you would change or what what advice would you give to somebody starting out right now, maybe? What I wouldn't change is having a few books under my belt because yeah. I I think that 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 provided kind of a cushion for me for almost a year mm-hmm. of, you know, having books or the, the mm-hmm. I was writing, but I didn't feel the like, oh my goodness, like I am, I am dying under this deadline because mm-hmm. I, you know, people are waiting for this book. Like, and, but also to be really smart about how to release them. So like when I released, that was during the rapid era, rapid <laughs> era where everyone's like release a book every month. And you're like, Okay, you know, but those books really could have probably have done those early books probably could have even done better if I had released them every three to four months. And Mm -hmm. that buffer period would have even elongated more than just a year, you know, so Mm -hmm. those two years I spent writing could have paid off almost two to three years Mm -hmm. in terms of publishing. And so that Mm -hmm. could have helped a lot, but I would not change in terms of pre writing, because I I Mm -hmm. do think that can really help. But I also would say that one thing that I think that all new authors should know is that what you start off writing and publishing might not be ultimately what you think you want to write and publish. Mm -hmm. 
because there's a difference between, I, I think there's a difference between sitting in your office without the pressures of the outside world and just writing to write. Mm -hmm. And then once you start publishing, realizing what actually makes you happy and what mm -hmm. makes your readers happy. And sometimes mm -hmm. those things change. And it doesn't mean that you're a failure if you're trying to switch gears. Mm -hmm. It just means that you're finding something that works better for you. Mm -hmm. um, and in that respect, to not drag your feet, I guess you could say, <laughs> Mm -hmm. um by putting up a front and like sometimes you all make mistakes like my um my series that is wrapping up this week um I had sp I had already been publishing for three or four years by the time it released but when I put it out the branding and marketing was all wrong and usually I get it right off the first bat but mm -hmm. I did not with this series mm -hmm. and I was so stubborn because I was like no it's the best cover no it's an amazing blurb and like I was wrong. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Or rather I wasn't wrong, but it was giving really mixed signals. You know, mm -hmm. the cover mm -hmm. was very um, romantic suspense, which I thought it were the people that would want to read this book, but it turns out it was really too dark for romantic suspense because mm -hmm. romantic suspense tends often to be more like Navy SEALs or like, mm -hmm. you know, bodyguard, not necessarily like morally gray characters, you mm -hmm. know, like they're more of the upstanding mm -hmm. gentleman, if you will. And yeah. so those readers were like, I don't want this book. But so dark romance readers were the ones that wanted it, that enjoyed it. However, they saw the cover and were like, that's not a book mm -hmm. I'd want to read. Mm -hmm. And so it took me like six or seven months to finally like get over myself <laughs> and just re you just redo the packaging and surely enough it's like it's, it's between my top number one bestseller series and number two like it flip flops mm -hmm. and previously it was like my worst seller mm -hmm. and so it does I don't like the idea when people say oh if it's just not selling just give up on it and keep going like no because that that is a book in your backlist that is going to make you money but don't be stubborn yeah if it's not yeah. selling like don't just put down your pride because yeah. then you'll make more money and you'll yeah. feel better. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that's a great segue into our next question, which is you switch genres um, <laughs> like what, two years ago? Yeah. Two years yeah, ago. Two years ago. So you had your super successful uh, put a ring on it series. You had a series before that, that was successful and people mm -hmm. love those books, but they are, they are lighter. They are more steamy contemporary. Um, and then you decided to go dark over <laughs> to the dark side. <laughs> yeah. Dark side. I dark. remember you talking about this series, uh, when we were in the Bahamas and yeah. you're talking about it. And I was like, wow, that's really different than what <laughs> she's been writing, but you were so passionate about it. I knew that it was what you really, really wanted to write like that was where your heart is and um or heart was still is yeah. and uh so tell us tell us about that transition how you like what brought you to that point I guess so I think that it it kind of manifested in like so you know how like when you start reading a genre mm -hmm. like sometimes it evolves like I started when I jumped into romance it was historicals and then mm -hmm. I went to um, and then I found Paranormal mm -hmm. because uh, Sherilyn Kenyon had two pen names, one historical, one paranormal. So then I like found my way to paranormal. And it wasn't until I was in college that I started reading contemporary, you know. And so you kind of like find your way along mm -hmm. as you go. And when I started um, writing, I was like, of course, I'm going to write what I read, you know, and mm -hmm. at that time I was reading contemporary. So mm -hmm. I was like, this is what I'm going to publish. Um, and I really enjoy it. Like I have a hockey series and I am a diehard hockey fan. And so I wrote mm -hmm. that series because I live in New Orleans now mm -hmm. and it was missing hockey and they never had it on in that time. That was before like, um, like, oh, you could just watch it online. So I was just like, I was desperate for it. So I was like, I'm going to write it because I'm desperate mm -hmm. for it. Um, but I found over time that I I didn't I loved I love those books so mm -hmm. I don't want anyone to think that I don't mm -hmm. um, but I didn't feel challenged mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. a craft way mm -hmm. and I, I didn't feel challenged in a 
almost in uh like you know how you do like uh mind puzzles types of stuff like I didn't mm-hmm. feel challenged in that way it felt very comforting which is great but I mm-hmm. wanted to push myself kind of like out of my comfort zone and I also started noticing I'm a huge per like a huge person that looks at the popular highlights in my mm-hmm. own books like I buy my books. I try to be the first one to buy it. I always do. And as people read it, I go through and I look at the popular highlights in the book and I use those for ad copy. I Mm -hmm. use it for everything. But I also started noticing that the scenes that people were highlighting were A, the way steamy parts, like the really, really steamy where I was like, oh, maybe this is too steamy. It was Mm -hmm. not. And or it was like the really angsty dark sections of the book Mm -hmm, and I was like mm -hmm. that is fascinating because when I watch tv when I watch movies I don't watch um romantic really anything like Mm -hmm. I really Mm -hmm. stick towards like uh thrillers not really horror but like thrillers or like historical dramas like Mm -hmm. I fantasy like that's where that's where I'm at like to the point that my husband and I like to joke that he's out here like rooting for the couple on like the TV. And I'm like, I don't care if they die. Like, it doesn't <laughs> yeah. But like in a book, like I'm like, if there's no romance, I'm not reading it. Like that's, right. like, that's my boundary. Like if I don't read anything but romance. And so I was like, what if I wrote what I like to watch, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, like what hooks me, what makes me like, I will watch a show. I'm a very big binge personality. Mm-hmm. So like, if something hooks me, like I will not sleep for five days and watch all seven mm-hmm. seasons. Like that's mm-hmm. just what I do. And um, so what I started doing between the popular highlights, noticing that kind of change um, in 2018, I started um, picking songs, like just random things once a month. And I would write this like really dark and twisted story to kind of go with it. Mm-hmm. And I would put it in my reader group to be like, like a free story, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And it's really mm-hmm. dark and effed up. Here you go. And mm-hmm. like they ate, they ate it up. They loved it. And I did that for a full year and lead up to my first dark romantic suspense because I wanted to, I didn't want it to be a shock to them <laughs> when I released this book. And to the right. point where like my assistant came up with the hashtag not a rom com as mm-hmm. kind of like a joke, like, hey guys, this is Maria, but this is not her Mm -hmm. usual fanfare like prepare yourself and it was fascinating to watch because those readers that came to me from that series the readers of mine who read that series um it was like I don't want to say cultish but it was way more than I had ever received in terms of like audience feedback like Mm -hmm. and I was like whoa maybe this is like something that I could do because it challenged me and I felt so um I guess you could say like I felt really fulfilled by it Mm -hmm. and so I wanted to write another series but I had said like I have to write this other series that I had like said that I would write and I enjoyed it and it that went on to be like my best my best-selling series of my entire career um but I was already planning at that point to start switching Mm -hmm. my kind of career tracks and the genres that I was writing Mm -hmm. Um, and knowing that I I'm in a way starting fresh because like I might have 10 books of steamy contemporary but I only have three to four dark romance Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so yeah yeah well um and and it is a challenge to write morally great characters who you make readers love you yes. know, and, and you redeem them or you don't redeem them and they still love them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I think that's awesome. Um, yeah, that, that was really, I just wanted you to, to explain that. Cause I think that's so important for listeners to hear and to, you know, if they've got that thing, that's really just kind of pulling them in another direction to pay attention to that. Yeah. And I didn't do a pen name. I know Mm -hmm. lots of people, if they swap, they might do a pen name for it. I I didn't. Some days I'm like, maybe I should have. Mm -hmm. Um, But for the most part, I I don't feel that way. um, Because I know that there are other readers out there that are like me that are are mood readers. You Mm -hmm. know, I'm a mood writer. They're a mood reader. I prefer to write dark, but 
I do like to talk, I do plan to toss in palette cleansers that like mm-hmm. maybe another book in my hockey series or mm-hmm. a stand, like I have a bunch of standalones that I've started that are steamy contemporary where, and even though I like dark, I, I also need something mm-hmm. kind of to break up, break up the villain era, mm-hmm. I guess you could say. <laughs> so, yeah. um, and so I can kind of toss those in. And so those are kind of just like, they're not throwaway books by any means, but they, mm-hmm. they're just enough for, you know, to bring you up, bring you up to the right. surface before I drag you back underneath. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so how do your readers feel about that? Like, how are you balancing the palate cleanser every so often? Are your readers okay with that? Have you, did you have to explain what was going on? Um, I really didn't get any pushback at all, you know, because all my series had been completed at that point. So I didn't have anything that was open-ended, you know, it, it wasn't like someone was waiting for, um, like, and I decided to write another Blades book that'll be coming out this year, but I did that just like, because I felt like it, because I was just mm-hmm. like, I just want to write another one. But to the, my audience, that series was also completed. So mm-hmm. I didn't, I didn't jump in to kind of switching gears with like open-ended books. Mm-hmm. So and I also try to think, I also tell my audience that the feels of the books are the same that they've always been. Like this love stories are really epic. You know, I don't, I don't, I didn't switch gears and like have cheating in my stories now. You know what I mean? Like, it, mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. the heart of the story is the same. It's just the surrounding factors that have changed. And mm-hmm. so I really haven't received really any pushback whatsoever. And I sometimes think we don't give readers enough credit and we assume that they only stay in one lane but that is not really the truth of the matter like a lot of them read all over the place Mm -hmm. and so they're kind of willing to go where you lead them as long Mm -hmm. as as long as like the true nature of your storytelling remains the same yeah right yeah if that makes sense well it sounds like you did a really good job Mm -hmm. like preparing Mm -hmm. them like yeah i was gonna say that i was really really smart Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was something. Yeah. And I even do like I package those up as a freebie on my website. And so like it's called it's called the first taste, you know, and mm-hmm. I mean, kind of like a, a play on it, you know, they mm-hmm. can get a taste of what I write. And it's funny, because I get people reading those. And they come to me and they're like, can you finish this one story? Because like, that was wild. I need to know mm-hmm. how it finishes. And I'm like, maybe one day, like, honestly, mm-hmm. maybe I will. Some of them I was really curious about. Um, but it, I think it. I think spending that year really kind of um, like shelling out little pieces mm-hmm. allowed me to actually. Kind of, I don't want to say jump ship, but it allowed me to change gears without losing people. That's yeah. great. Yeah, that's awesome. So it takes you longer to write these new these darker books, correct? It does. Yeah. <laughs> well, first of all, first of all, they're they're link they're they're longer. And then there's some sort of, I don't know about historical, but I mean, you're a historian, but I mean, they just are more layered. They are, they're, they're darker, they're more layered. And uh, so you haven't put out a book for a while, correct? Two years. Yeah. Yeah. Me and you both. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) It was not the plan. COVID was not kind to my, uh, well, not even COVID just was, there was a lot of, um, things happening in like my personal life where Mm -hmm, I'm mm -hmm. you know one thing happens and you're like it's okay I can I can jump over this hurdle and like the second thing happens and you're like I am okay it's all Mm -hmm. gonna be okay I'm so sorry my dog (laughs) just came running inside um you're like I'm all right it's fine and then like the third and fourth fifth thing happened you're like I'm just gonna lay down Mm -hmm. and (laughs) and just wait until like the storm is over and so that was the, a lot of that impacted my ability to write where I would mm-hmm. like, there's probably like seven months. I just looked at my computer and was like, mm-hmm. no, I don't, mm-hmm. I don't have it in me to mm-hmm. do anything. But in that time I was really focused on the business side to mm-hmm. make sure I was still making money. So even yeah. though I wasn't, I wasn't putting out anything, I was still really kind of geared up to, mm-hmm. and still hustling to make yeah. sure I could keep this as a full-time job. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. That's great. That's great. And I think that's important for people to hear that, um, and judging, because I was at the signing last week that where you were signing, I was standing at your table and uh, it, you hadn't lost any popularity. That's for sure. Because mm-hmm. people were, people were really, uh, they were just really interested and they really wanted to talk to you about the books. And 
I love that. And um, so tell us what you wish you'd known, though, about switching genres. Is there anything else uh, that you haven't covered that you think you wish that we should know? I think reader expectations Mm -hmm. kind of change Mm -hmm. a little bit, Mm -hmm. not in terms of like the, not in terms of, oh, people want them faster or anything Mm -hmm. like that. Not in that respect, Mm -hmm. but in the, in that genre, there will be different expectations Mm -hmm. and you shouldn't assume that what works in one genre will work in another. So one of the things that I get the most, for example, off my current series is it's interconnected standalones. And I Mm -hmm. actually get a lot of comments. Like it'll be, it'll be like a five-star review Mm -hmm. and they'll say here, it's like five-star and one star, right? It'll be Mm -hmm. a five-star review. That'll say, I absolutely love this book. It's one of the best books I've ever read, but because this couple is not in the next book, it's a different couple. I don't want to read it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. versus I will also get a one star that'll say I hate when reader I hate when authors do this they take a book to tell you about this couple and then it's a cop-out because they exact words I (laughs) recently saw that review last week it's a cop-out because now that couple is not the same couple in the second book it's a different Mm. couple Um, and it's like it's bizarre to me like I coming from contemporary I'm like I don't understand interconnected standalones are so prevalent you know mm-hmm. what i'm saying yeah. but it's the in, norm it's, it's the, norm. the norm but in dark romance a lot of the times you have a lot of duets that mm-hmm. are the same couple you have a lot of trilogies that are the same couple mm-hmm. you have a lot of authors that will package so they release it as true standalones mm-hmm. even though it's in the same world so they don't combine them on the amazon book page oh really yeah yep so there it's a standalone and it might be they might all be brothers like Mm -hmm. all the heroes but Mm -hmm. they don't actually combine them on like they don't link them on amazon and that has been really fascinating to me because when i came from contemporary like it's a no-brainer that you Mm -hmm. just have series of interconnected standalones Mm -hmm. but dark romance it you do have them but it is definitely not as prevalent as like duets and trilogies and certainly not as prevalent as um people just uploading them as individual titles as opposed mm-hmm. to combining them so yeah. like it's crazy like you can have a five star and a one star that they're literally complaining about the same thing mm-hmm. but they're right. like, it's such a good book i loved it but i'm not mm-hmm. going to continue in the series because i only want to read about this couple i don't want to mm-hmm. read about any other couple right. and on the flip side being like wow that was a cop out of the author to write this whole book about this couple and now we're going to jump into a different couple it's not yeah, yeah. so yeah. And that's what I'm talking about, like reader expectations is like, yeah, just, I would not have even thought about that. Yeah. So, like yeah, you have to so really just make sure that you open your kind of open your eyes up to what right. readers might expect in that genre right. and that what you're yeah. coming from, it might not be the same. Right. So, and the, and your Broken Crown series really needs to be read in order. In order. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, so that's what I was going to ask. Do the, do that, those readers, do they want like an, uh, bigger story like for three books do they want like a story yeah. arc that runs through all two or three books yeah and like my books wow. are really long like mm-hmm. though that series one of them is 165k i could have easily broken that up into a trilogy or mm-hmm. a duet you know what i mean mm-hmm. just found a natural cutoff place and then like mm-hmm. separated them and been like here here's this trilogy, you know, of this one couple, but I didn't, I put them all into one standalone because I didn't want, I didn't want, I, I didn't want to do, they do have cliffhangers, Mm -hmm. but it's cliffhangers for the plot, not the couples. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to just package it as like one book, like, here you go. But sometimes I'm like, maybe I should have done that. You know what I mean? (laughs) Mm -hmm. But like, Mm -hmm. but you can't win because I have a duet that's dark and that has a cliffhanger, same couple. And when I do have negative reviews, it's like, I hate when authors do a cliffhanger and I have to <laughs> buy the next book. So you, but they lie, they <laughs> lie. So I, I literally did Broken Crown differently because mm-hmm. of the feedback on that book where people were like, I don't want to have to buy a second book just to finish the story. So I was right. like, I'm going to give you it to you in one book <laughs> yeah. as opposed to like two or three books. Yeah. But then you have people being like, how dare it not be? Yeah. 
Yeah. You just can't make everybody happy. You can't. It's just impossible. Yeah. 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 So I'm like, it is what it is, you know, yeah. but, mm-hmm. but yeah, just be awesome. aware, I guess. Yeah. Well. Yeah. So. yeah. Yeah. Well, this has been so good. It and has. It's just been good to talk about things that we don't normally hear about, like taking mm-hmm. a break. And like, basically you switched from rapid release to releasing more slowly. So I think it's very cool. And I think people get a lot out of it. So, but we always want to end by asking um, what's the best thing you've done to set yourself up for success? Um, I think the best thing I've done is um, understanding advertising. Mm-hmm. So I know we didn't really talk too much about advertising like and or marketing, but I, I think that that is what's kept me going mm-hmm. you know, because you will have, you will have the books that just like, for whatever reason, they're just like instant, instantly loved by readers and mm-hmm. like you could spend a dollar and make $50 mm-hmm. and you don't have to even try, but you will have the books that are much harder to sell. Mm-hmm. Um, and you have to, you still have to sell them, right? Like they still have to make you money. And so understanding advertising from the beginning and not letting my success we'll come back to that word again, not letting my success be determined by how other people feel about my books and whether or not they want to recommend them. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense, like mm-hmm. taking that power into my own hands and making yeah. sure mm-hmm. that I, if I pull the lever, I make more money mm-hmm. as opposed to just kind of waiting for that, that money success, you know, whatever the case may be to come to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Great answer. Yeah. So tell people where they can find you and find out more about your books and all of that. So I am on the usual places. I'm on Facebook and Instagram, um, just under Maria Lewis author and TikTok as well. I'm, I love TikTok, but in small doses, like we talked about. Um, and also in my reader group, Book Boyfriends Anonymous and and on my website i am not on twitter because twitter yeah. scares me yes. <laughs> but i but i'm on the i'm on the rest of the places just yeah. kind of hanging out and doing my thing very okay. good very Perfect. good all right well we will have all those links at wish i known them podcast.com and um thanks for, to everybody for listening today thanks for to maria for coming in thanks to thanks Alyssa larberg <laughs> for editing and producing the podcast and adriel wiggins for doing the admin we'll see everybody next week Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening and we hope you enjoyed the show. If you would like to support our podcast, you can find the link to do so at wishidknownthenforwriters.com backslash support. See you again next week.